it's, it's going to be an interesting session because we're not talking about, strictly speaking, health tech. We're talking about some of those outer edge things, you know, biometric identification. We're talking about virtual reality. Um, but there are some really interesting ways in which they are going to be intersecting with healthcare and already are. So um, I'm going to let Mary and Carl tell you <laughs> more about that. It, starting with you, Mary, can you just tell us a little bit about the company and, and where you see it having a particularly medical uh, application right now? Sure, absolutely. So um, Next Galaxy, we provide uh, virtual reality content. We also have a platform for distributing uh, virtual reality applications. As well, we're looking at um, haptics and other forms of uh, VR for remote diagnosis and uh, telemedicine. We're currently working with um, uh, hospitals in uh, creating VR training. For We're doing things like CPR and other forms of uh, VR training. And then we're also working with uh, medical schools to convert a lot of the traditional videos and 2D training into virtual reality, fully immersive uh, training. So is training is your big uh, sort of money maker or uh, you know, the, the big focus area at the moment? Yeah, training. And then uh, on the roadmap also, we're looking at telemedicine, which is ultimately where we believe virtual reality will have a place in healthcare. Tell us a little bit about the training um, to start with. Why is, that, why is it better to do training by a virtual reality than it is in, in, in say, real life or through some other means. Right. It's, it's so much better to do training using virtual reality because, uh, you know, for a lot of medical schools now, uh, they use videos or 2D models. So, and even with medical professionals, there are a lot of procedures that they can't actually practice. Um, with video. Video is a very uh, passive uh, medium, so they just you know, watch the video. But with the, uh, virtual reality, they're actually able to be fully immersed in the process, and they can do things that they can't do. There is real-time feedback. Uh, they're able to, for example, in the case of CPR, do actual compressions uh, on the patient. They can you know, lift the patient and do so many other things that you simply can't do with traditional video. And are you actually seeing better results from doing it this way? Well, we've had, uh, we have some pilots that we've rolled out uh, more recently with the CPR, with EMT, uh, with parents, uh, and then also with medical professionals. We have some studies that have come out of the hospitals that we work with. We're working, for example, with the Miami uh, Children's Health Systems. And some of the studies that they've done have shown about 80% better retention using immersive training so um, a year later, after uh, doing training in an immersive environment, most people retain about 80% uh, compared to just with text and video, where they only retain about 20% just one week later. So it's a tremendous uh, improvement because we're very visual as, you know, as humans. And, uh, you know, with VR, you, uh, I think the greatest thing with VR is the fact that people are creating memories. So they feel like they've actually done the procedure. So for medical doctors uh, and other professionals, they, by practicing within VR, feel as if they've actually done the process. Yeah. So the first time that they're treating a patient or practicing is not on the table. So you can actually get that muscle memory going. Exactly, exactly. Now, I want to come back to the telemedicine mm -hmm. in a minute because there's a really neat connection between t these two yeah. when we get onto that. But I would like, Carl, to, can you tell us a bit about NIMI and, and, and how that might have some applications at this moment for medicine? Sure, so, uh, so we're in the business of trust. More specifically, how do people, individuals, establish secure connections with the things they interact with? And so how we do this is through wearable authentication. So we have a device called the NIMI band, uh, which uses unique biometric, uh, which is the cardiac rhythm. So the electrocardiogram, the, the uh, electrical activity of the heart, is a unique signature that we can recognize individuals with. But uh, more importantly, we can put that into a device, make that device recognize you when you put it on, so that passively now you have this establishment of trust. And so uh, where, where this is applied is when people are interacting uh, dynamically with computers, with people, with devices, uh, that automatically you, one does not have to provide a token, a password, a PIN uh, to securely interact with them. And one of the areas where we get a ton of interest in this is actually in medical, clinical environments. Um, today, clinical environments are very much about dynamically accessing information 
high speed, but lots of people uh, moving about physical spaces. And so establishing trust, the you know, personal health information is very uh, obviously sensitive, uh, but also access to physical spaces, f access to pharmaceuticals. Um, but doctors and nurses d don't want to be impeded in their jobs. So where our technology is being used is that uh, d clinicians can use this, uh, just wear it, and they don't have to do what they're doing today, which is sharing passwords and sharing uh, you know, key cards. Um, and so uh, the idea is to make trust just assumed, and doctors and nurses can go about their business. And I have to ask a really stupid question here, if I can, but is your ECG really unique enough to use as a, an identifier? So the electrocardiogram, which we actually call essentially a medical biometric, because traditionally it was a just used for medical diagnostics, it is actually unique for every person. And uh, this was established actually decades ago where doctors, when they're first starting to use uh, electrocardiogram uh, for diagnostics, notice these actually annoying features which are, have nothing to do with any uh, you know, medical issue, or just where the, every person's different physiology created different features in the waveform based on the shape of your heart, the position of your heart. And so this was known for decades, but it's only been in recent years when this has been turned into automated systems, you know, based, uh, you know, we're actually based on research from the University of Toronto, set of algorithms which can, act can actually automatically extract features and recognize a person. And I think you were saying it's about as unique as a, a fingerprint. Yeah, so the uniqueness is uh, very close to the fingerprint to what you get on your Touch ID on your iPhone. Uh, but the big difference with something like a fingerprint or iris or face is that it's very closely tied to the body. Um, you know, you leave your fingerprints everywhere. You, uh, you know, your face and your iris can be captured at a distance without your knowledge. Uh, your electrocardiogram is very unlikely to be captured without your knowledge. It's quite very closely tied to the body and is as close to a secret uh, of of a biometric as any. So at the moment, we're talking about this being used perhaps by medical staff to, you know, to get access. Um, but it would be interesting to hear from both of you, where, where is this likely to go in sort of, where, where, can, where could we be in the next five years? I mean, Mary, this is maybe where you can tell us a little bit about the uh, you know, telemedicine and, 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 and show us the gloves. <laughs> right, like, right. You, you have to see the gloves. So, uh, so in terms of uh, telemedicine uh, with uh, you know, VR, ultimately the goal is to be able to use uh, mobile phones for people to, for doctors to be able to uh, make diagnosis of people around the world. Um, and when it comes to being able to diagnose and also maybe even uh, provide care to people through telemedicine is very, very important to do the authentication uh, that you know the person is actually who they are, which is where the biometrics come in. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, things like retinal, um, as well as even pulse detection with the uh, retinal identification, as well as um, you know other different types of uh, biometrics. But the whole idea behind that is that for a doctor, no matter where they are in the world, to be able to use some kind of force feedback uh, device, you know, pair that with the patient. Uh, and then they would be able to, you know, touch and actually feel even things like lumps on a patient using uh, some sort of a, a sensor and, a, you know, a glove. Um, and then the patient on the other end will use uh, a telephone, if, you know, their mobile phone to be able to do the scans. Um, and, and it will feel as if they're actually there with the doctor in real life. So you would be scanning your body with your mobile phone. How does that actually tell the doctor that there might be a lump there? Right, so looking at uh, force uh, feedback, so some of the force feed devices are actually able to tell pressure at certain points. And so those electrical impulses are transmitted um, as you know, data to the uh, devices to the uh, um, to the you know gloves, and so then they will be able to tell from that density if there is you know a lump. Of course, is not going to be 100% accurate, but for a lot of these diagnoses, it doesn't have to be you know 100%. They just have to be able to feel certain densities within uh, you know the mass. Um, so those are some of the things that you're going to be able to do remotely, so a patient can be actually in the physical space with the doctor, and the doctor can you know, reach out and touch a patient no matter where they are in the world. And how quickly do you think these will become sort of really usable products? I mean, what stage are we at with that sort of haptic feedback? Um, a lot of what we're doing now in terms of the haptic feedback and the you know, remote diagnosis are all in the laboratory stage. So we're looking at it 
Um, there are things that you know we've been able to do with uh, certain medical facilities, but I would say we're still probably about 12 months away from being realistically able to roll that out completely. But in terms of things like CPR and um, you know some of the other uh, VR training that we're doing, that is you know just simply months away. Okay, so that's virtually yeah. happening now. That's virtually happening now, and then also with the biometric detection, all of that is virtually it's happening now yeah. with the pulse detection and retinal yeah, yeah scans. And, and with this telemedicine, I mean this is uh, where you know, something like the NIMI band, you know, this is going to be important to identify that the person that you're treating really is the person that they say they are when you, you know, prescribe medicine, the right person is getting it. I mean, is that that's something that you're thinking about? And then maybe, Carl, you can speak to how you, I mean, do, you guys could work together, presumably, right, on this. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, especially with the, you know, electrocardiogram, that's very interesting being that it's very unique. Uh, in the case of a lot of what we do, it's more about identification. Um, and, and, and so as authentication becomes important as well in order to be able to prescribe certain types of medication, being able to have that unique identifier is key. It's going to be critical. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you see the company moving into? Is there yeah, an interest in that? Absolutely. I mean, as I had sort of said it before, we're, we're looking at trust in a very general sense, which is, you know, the, the old model of trust is based on implied trust, right? You go to a doctor's office or a clinical mm -hmm. environment, uh, you know, you, you, you patient has a sign-in procedure that identifies them. Um, doctor is presumably using identification to make sure that it is the correct mm -hmm. doctor there. Um, and this, these are very localized systems that establish mm -hmm. trust based on this, uh, you know, model. But now you have a, a newer model of geographic diversity. You have people connecting mm -hmm. dynamically. You know, expertise could be anywhere in the world. Patients can be anywhere in the world. Um, and so there's this question of how do you establish trust? And it's not just about knowing who is on the other end. I mean, if you have a regular relationship, you know, you can perhaps do that over video. But it also comes to things like prescriptions. And I mean, there's a concept of, uh, you know, it's obviously, I think everybody here probably recognizes how old school, uh, you know, prescription pad that has mm -hmm. the, you know, and the inscription of the doctor and the trust implied with that, you know, moving into digital signatures, digital prescriptions, how is that done? There needs to be a chain of trust. And, you know, we always look at ourselves as that first mile of trust, which is the human being. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of other people working on the systems that connect people and making that useful for, uh, you know, clinical type um, interactions. We're about how do you have trust there, and and I think a lot of people are realizing that that's not a trivial problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to ask you both about is obviously whenever we're dealing with people's medical histories, I mean, this is hugely sensitive. So the privacy aspect of this is is huge. How how are you dealing with that? I'll I'll, I'll start with Carl, and then. Yeah. So I mean, I, I referred to you before about. Uh, what actually we see happens today, which is that in clinical environments, uh, medical health records, uh, obviously very sensitive private information, you have doctors and nurses sharing uh, passwords, sharing key cards, because uh, speed and uh, actual you know, medical services is higher priority. You're talking life and death. Um, but we shouldn't have to compromise uh, privacy. And I mean, I hate to say it, where, where we come from in Canada and in, in the province of Ontario, going digital in the health system has become a complete boondoggle because of this challenge of how to meet all of the needs and it ends up defaulting back to the old systems. And so, um, you know, we see ourselves as, as offering an important piece of the puzzle which is that, uh, you know, data itself, obviously, access has to be controlled. Um, there's also this uh, element of auditing, right? The idea is you need to have a record of who's accessing what and have accountability towards that. And, uh, you know, we've actually designed our product from the ground up that uh, the user themselves also has privacy. It's not just the privacy of the information there that when a person is using this, we don't release biometric data from this. There is no central biometric database that a person is forced to enroll into to use this. The biometric is between them and their access device, and then we're just using digital signatures, which can be revoked. You can make many digital signatures per person, uh, and uh, it's unlike a massive biometric database, which, if hacked, is a serious problem for those people. Mm -hmm. and, and what about with you guys? Do you um, look at the privacy issue with telemedicine? Right, absolutely. And it becomes even more um, exponential when you're talking about telemedicine because you really can't tell you know, 
who the patient is or whose medical information you're accessing, which is also why uh, you know, biometric authentication and identification becomes extremely important because that's one way of uh, bypassing the process. And so we look to third parties that are doing you know, exactly what uh, Carl and uh, Nyemi are doing to be able to uh, protect against uh, you know, a lot of the privacy issues that are out there. Yeah. So what stage are your companies at now? I mean, uh, you, you know, you, you've, you've got some funding. Are you looking for, for more? What, what, what will take you to the next stage now? So, um, so you know, we're, we're, still considered, uh, we're still considered a startup, right? There are a lot of things happening now. We're working with uh, a couple of medical schools that do training for 150 other medical schools. And then we have uh, some of the largest uh, medical facilities out there that we're working with. Um, you know, one with uh, the CPR, we have <clears throat> other medical procedures such as tracheal insertion and so on and so forth that are going on. So we have a very, very robust pipeline, which a lot of that has happened much, much faster than we anticipated. Uh, we're currently in the process of raising capital. We have done an initial capital raise, but we're in the process of uh, raising capital. We consider ourselves uh, a startup. So in spite of, we have some revenue, uh, which is very rare in this space, but uh, we still consider ourselves a startup and raising capital. Yeah. And, and Carl, are you still a startup? Yeah, we are. So I mean, we're, uh, the company itself is four and a half years old, which is, you know, by some measures getting old, but uh, we, we have, we were a spin-off of the University of Toronto trying to commercialize this technology, and we really only came up with the concept of the wearable authenticator about two and a half years ago. Uh, at that point, we were three people, we're 35 people now, have about 15 million in venture financing. But uh, I think as, uh, as you would recognize, and many people recognize, hardware is hard and expensive, and mm -hmm. I would say anybody doing a startup, don't do hardware if you don't <laughs> have to. Um, but uh, the, uh, we're just, uh, we have a few thousand users of uh, what we're still considering our beta device. Um, we're really focused around uh, sort of uh, this sort of enterprise, industry-specific, healthcare, uh, banking is another area where uh, you, you have a need for high security, but you don't want to impede the flow of, of people and what they're doing. And so we, we have a variety of pilots, you know, a few hundred users here and there, um, and uh, going sort of to full commercialization next year. And how have you found the experience of, of, of going into the medical sector as a, as a target market? I mean, this is notoriously difficult. Everybody says, you know, that decision making is slow, that you're dealing with institutions that may not want to fully change. Um, how's it been for you? Um, interestingly enough for us, the almost like healthcare kind of found us. Our background is in entertainment. So um, it's been really interesting because um, uh, you know, we've traditionally created content for the entertainment world, but uh, here we are, so we have the same kind of 3D animators that are working on Halo and other things that are now working on CPR models. Uh, I, I think it's, it's been, you know, it's been a very uh, quick process because of, of the product. There's such a huge demand uh, for the type of services that we're offering, so we've kind of come, you know, to healthcare by default, by you know, the medical facility saying, hey, we need this type of immersive training. Doctors need to be able to practice this way. And the medical school saying, this is the way to go. So it's been, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's been easy because it hasn't, but it's kind of found us rather okay. than being the other way around. Okay. So. Yeah, and for us, I mean, we actually got largely pulled into healthcare through partners, and we uh, we have very much a partner model where to go into different industries, uh, you know, we don't necessarily, uh, we're not necessarily able to do it all ourselves, and so we uh, we actually have a lot of companies that deliver complete healthcare clinical environment solutions that have pulled us in and said there's an important need there that we really need to address. And would you have any final advice for people who are looking at developing something for, for med tech? I mean... You know, did you, should you really wait for them to come to you? Is that, that seems to be the experience that's worked for both of you. Um, I think the biggest advice uh, would be, you know, and, and this would be general, for any type of disruptive uh, technology, it has to have the ability to impact people in a transformative way. So, you know, to us, we always say that our job begins the day someone says, CPR saved my life. Whether it's that medical, you know, provider or the doctor who can diagnose Ebola without being at risk or that patient. So just find something that's going to be impactful and transformative, you know, in terms of uh, quality of life for people, especially within healthcare. Yeah. 
And I would just say briefly that if you don't have specific expertise selling into healthcare, then either do it with a partner or, or pull in that expertise because it, is, it does have idiosyncrasies that uh, selling into very slow moving organizations. <laughs> All right, I think that sounds like good advice, and I think we are out of time, so oh, thank you so much, nice. though, for taking us through it. Who knows where we could be, you know, in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, awesome. thank you.